there's sort of two, two elements of this. One is that, uh, of course, there's the current crisis, and the current crisis has led to a lot of discussion around was economics really in a position, or is it in a position to both understand the crisis and was it in a position to see it coming? And I think the answer is, on the, on the whole, not just economists, but policymakers and others didn't really see this coming. And so some of the changes I envisage are going to be to do with, well, why didn't we? What, was, what, is, what in our discipline, what in our models, what in our way of offering policy advice needs to, needs to change? So I think there'll be a lot that's really what you might call a response to the crisis. Where do I think that will have bite in terms of the way the discipline changes? Well, on the, what, one thing's clear. I think we're going to question the extent to which the notions of rationality and rational behavior that we've been traditionally working with need to be relaxed now. That's not as new as a lot of people think, namely economics is for a long time worried about those issues and there's, in more recent years what we call behavioral economics has become a big, uh, big area. So, so it's not as novel as some people would say, but surely there'll be more work in that area. I think it'll be a boost to work in an area close to my own heart, which is the local economy. To what extent was this something where it was the interplay between markets and government um, the ability of government to spot and to define regulatory solutions, political incentives as well as economic incentives. After all, the, the last group on earth that wanted to call a halt to this were politicians because they were often benefiting from the fruits of this. And I don't mean in underhand ways, I mean if you're sitting on top of an economy that's successful, that's good for politicians. So I think it'll be a boost to therefore to us thinking harder about some of the political economy issues too. Well, I certainly think that one of the areas that we've really exposed on is understanding how a regular set of, a set of regulatory systems that are essentially national can sit above an essentially globalized economy. And I think there's nowhere more striking than in the area of finance. You know, we, over a period of time, we opened up our financial markets. And there were very strong arguments to say free flow of capital across borders was going to yield benefits. But of course, it's also shown been shown to, to your vulnerabilities. And I think understanding the interplay between um, national institutions uh, and globalized economies is, is a big area we need to understand better. Um, now, just broadly speaking, you can say there's sort of two directions to go in. You can either pull back from globalization and say, actually, you know, this, the risks associated with openness are too big to manage, and therefore we need to start to retreat from that. The other alternative is to say, no, there are genuinely global regulatory solutions. But for that, one doesn't just need to understand the global politics of it, which of course is very important. One also needs to understand you know, what's feasible in terms of regulatory structures that could work in a global economy and how they could work. Um, so I think those are the big challenges, is really, uh, in, in a way, understanding the interplay of the economics and the, and the politics, uh, and that means understanding the structure of the global economy better than perhaps we have and the vulnerabilities that that has given rise to. And when I look at the specific areas where right now we're trying to build global cooperation in the economy, um, I think the failures and the areas where we're short far outnumber the areas of success. So where would the successes be? I think trade policy, you could say, is a slow grinding but largely in the right direction area of policy. But things like global financial regulation, I don't think we're first base, to be honest. Um, and even if you said, let's take the European Union, which is not, of course, global, that's a multilateral uh, institutional solution, you could say, well, we, we're not even very far along in the area of, say, financial regulation, even at the European Union level. We could be optimistic that some stuff could happen, but we're well, well short of saying that there are going to be European solutions. So I, I'm, I'm largely of the view that even if one could get it right multilaterally, say the European Union, the idea we would get this right for a long time at the global level, I think, is just way, way overly optimistic. Well, we don't yet have, even where we have global institutions, something that looks like it's representative of global interest. So take an organization like the IMF. You know, the governance structure of the IMF reflects the world as it was circa 1950, whenever you want to freeze it in time. Uh, and until we have ways of making these things more representative of how the global economy is. So you know, there are some organizational innovations that look promising. The G20 perhaps beginning to displace the G7. That's kind of 
makes, makes it look like it's more representative of the global economy. But I think then we face a serious friction, which is there are still significant parts of the globe that are not democratic and don't subscribe fully to democratic values. And I wonder how far that's also going to be a hindrance towards building properly representative global institutions when there's a deep suspicion of doing too much business with essentially autocratic uh, parties. And that's going to be a source of friction that I don't think will be cleared away anytime soon, given some of the very important e economic players that are not yet dem democratic. I certainly think there's a scope for understanding these things well, but many of the issues are deeply practical. I don't want to suggest that you know if we got the research right tomorrow, suddenly the, you know, nirvana would arise from that. I think we have to be realistic. So I think we can, in, in the form of research, understand better the hindrances and the frictions that prevent us from getting properly global solutions and understand the incentives of different parties, which is the kind of thing research can be good at doing. But I don't think that's going to necessarily, even if we had the best possible understanding of all those things, turning that into practical reality is a whole new step beyond where we are. But of course I am, sitting where I do, it's not surprising, optimistic that if the research is good, we have a good understanding both empirical and theoretical of the issues that will facilitate moving to the next stage, which is making practical policy. I mean, there's kind of a number of steps along this, along this route. One, one is the sort of basic research needs to be done. The other is that the basic research then needs to be brought together to inform the policy debate, and I think global policy will play a key role in that. And then ultimately, there's being an influential advocate out in the world, getting a wide enough readership, a wide enough buy-in. And I thought a journal like Global Policy could play a role in informing the key parties that have to ultimately get together and be part of any global, global solution here.